We really need to think about ourselves as owners rather than just consumers. Rather than spending on a company, own the company. We're not here to just pay British gas. We're not here to just play Zara. But again, it's that principle of if you don't know where you're starting, how can you set goals about where you're going? Looking at your net worth, being brave, looking at that number. It might not be good now, but in the future, where do you want it to be? If you get into that habit of paying yourself first, putting some money aside for yourself, that will last you for a lifetime. There's not a person in the world who hasn't made a financial mistake. Ultimately, you make a decision with the knowledge that you have at the time. Forgive yourself. Don't beat yourself up. There's no point because a lot of us have never been taught. It's just not one of those things that's accessible to people. If you grow up in a household like mine, whereby it wasn't really discussed, like where do we learn these things from? It's billions of pounds that women are missing out on and those who are from black Asian backgrounds. That's money not going into pensions. It's money that we don't have disposable income for now. There will be some women who they have a baby, they want to take time out and that's what they want to focus on. And they should be able to do that and they shouldn't be criticised for doing Doing that at the same time there might be a woman who just wants to work that shouldn't be criticized either we need to be investing in assets assets are things that you can actually pass on to others liabilities you can't if i hadn't have started to use money in a way that like valued myself i wouldn't be here you're not defined by where you, where you come from. Yeah. And I think that's a big message that I always yeah. want to tell people like like you have to be able to be uncomfortable yeah. like be comfortable with being uncomfortable When you grow up in ends, you don't realise it when you're confident, but you have an audacity to do things that ordinarily most people wouldn't be willing to do. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I'm your host, Atto. We've got a special guest in the building, Selena, founder of Black Girl Finance. How are you doing today, Selena? I'm really well. I'm good. I'm excited to be on here. <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited to have this conversation with you. I think it's gonna be I think it's gonna be very, very fun. So how's your day been today? It's been good. It's been nice, you know. I got up early. Uh, well, I woke up early. I didn't like plan to be up, you mm. know, when the, when the sun comes in and then you're just awake. So that was that. I had a cup of cup of tea. Uh, did my Bible app prayer um, and then just set off to come here to, yeah. to record today. So yeah, it's been yeah. a nice chilled morning. I like that. I like, I like the fact that you mentioned the Bible app prayer because I got the Bible app as yeah. well, right? That's with the daily prayers, <laughs> yes, right? Yes, yeah. So yeah. I did it's that. It's so cool, right? Yeah, yeah. it's good. Yeah. It, it keeps me focused. And um, I think today's lesson was about, one that I read was about having a gift in my hand. And it, like it was like, close your eyes, put your hands out and think about the gift that you've got from God. And quite incidentally today is the day where it's my son's birthday so hey, i was very much thinking about son, him yeah. thank you i was very yeah. much thinking about him when i was thinking about you know the gift you know yeah he's a blessing <laughs> amazing 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 okay so obviously I, i've you know i introduced you as the founder of black girl finance but you know who is selena who is selena um it's quite um I don't know, a bit poetic because we're here in the studio. Uh, we're here in, I don't know, can I say where the studio is yeah, based? Yeah, 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 we're in Hackney. Yeah. I literally could walk to my aunt's house from here. <laughs> I could have driven past my school, my primary school that I went to, but I didn't. I didn't. I came straight here. But um, yeah, so I, I feel like I'm like Selena Flavius. I'm an ordinary black girl from Hackney, East London, who um, has gotten into this finance space. And yeah, I'm, I'm kind of blessed because I'm doing what I love in this season of my life. So yeah, I'm just, I'm Selena Flavius. I'm the founder of Black Girl Finance and I'm an author. So I've written a book called Black Girl Finance, Let's yep. Talk Money. Right yep. um, you got here. Yep. Get your copies. Yes, please do go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, uh, well, I previously had a podcast. So there is some episodes floating around called Black Girl Finance, Let's Talk Money, some podcasts, um, wherever you find your podcasts. As a, as a business, we offer financial advice, uh, and planning as well as financial coaching and yeah I'm a massive big Beyonce fan okay yeah love okay, her cool. <laughs> and uh massively into yoga so you know I'm a mum uh you know Beyonce fan uh, I run my own business and I'm just yeah I'm just out here yeah love that <laughs> I love that I love all of you know that and let's let's talk a bit about your story because it's always great to you know know the person behind you know some of these great businesses so I guess uh you, you said that you were you say you grew up in Hackney. Were you did you were, were you born in Hackney? Yeah, as well? yeah, yeah, born in Hackney. Grew up in yeah. Hackney, uh, Upper Clapton, Springfield, okay. to be cool. specific. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. these these are my roots. <laughs> these are your roots. And where were your parents from? 
So my parents are from the Caribbean. So my mum's from St. Lucia and my mm. dad's from Barbados. And wow, I went, I went to Barbados. It's amazing. Beautiful. Yeah. Both yeah. islands are beautiful. Yeah. And what can I say? Yeah, so they both came here as teenagers, I think around the age of like 15, 16. Both have similar backgrounds in that they, you know, their parents came to the UK to, mm. you know, I guess, better their lives, seek their fortune. Yeah. Um, and then they kind of sent for them, which is, is which is what they do. So their children came over and yeah, and, and they ended up meeting. I can't remember. I did ask my dad the other day where they met and I think it was uh, maybe in some some sort of factory. <laughs> factory, okay. <laughs> yeah, cool, some sort of factory cool, job cool. they met. And yeah, and um, I'm one of five on my mum's side. So I grew up in Hackney. Um, with like five siblings in the household with my mum and then I but I'm one of nine basically okay. so I've got you know um, uh, brothers and sisters uh, on my dad's side as well so yeah big family yeah yeah big family what was it like you know being in such a big family yeah so I think I don't have a big family myself so I'm mm. a mum I don't have a big family I'm, I'm a mum of one but in terms of like childhood and growing up it was a lot of fun I've got a twin sister as well, yeah. so that's a different. That's a whole different dynamic, you yeah. know. When you've got a twin sister, you've always maybe got someone there to to share life with, um, which is which is a blessing. And then with my other siblings as well, kind of uh, two older brothers, an older sister. Yeah, it, it, it's a blessing. It was yeah. it was a fun household, you yeah. know. It was a very um, traditional Caribbean household. Okay. So, so for example. You know, we had, you know, Caribbean music uh, playing, you know, it, it, it like my Caribbean roots are very instilled in me in terms yeah. of like the food, the culture, even though I'm British born, born here, but yeah. still, you know, the Caribbean, my, like my mum, she's St. Lucian, she speaks, you know, um, Creole. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, very Caribbean woman <laughs> yeah, <laughs> from fair, Hackney. Fair. <laughs> I love that. I love the fact that, you know, I think... You know, living in a big family and the fact that you shared it in such a positive light. Because I think some people take it, for, you know, mm -hmm. take it for granted yeah. having such a big family and, you know, having people there yeah. sometimes. I feel people don't like really appreciate it until they get a bit older. And like, oh, actually, you know what? That was kind of fun. Yeah. yeah no, yeah. I mean, for me, it was yeah. it was just a blessing. And like I say, um, the dynamic of having like a twin sister, like same age, going through mm -hmm. the same, more or less the same thing yeah. as you at the same time you know, that, that kind of helps as well. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think is like the biggest lessons that you learned from your parents, you know, whilst growing up? Yeah, so my mum, super hardworking, super caring. Mm. And uh, I would say probably a lot more sensible, you know. My dad, my dad was more carefree and fun so I feel like I've got a mixture of the both of them okay. so there's a part of me that's a bit more spontaneous and then there is a, a, a big part of me that's kind of like you know really hard working ambitious and um goal goal orientated and I think I definitely get that from my mum so I okay. like, like I said I grew up with, with my mum very matriarchal matriarchal what don't know if word matriarchal household um you know she made all of the decisions and that was the kind of what I saw growing up so it's kind of like I guess what I have um replicated okay. if that makes sense because yeah. that was the example okay. um, and my dad he, you know my dad very fun guy very you know supportive and loving but yeah very carefree, okay. <laughs> very carefree. carefree. sometimes you need that you need that balance you yeah. can't be too much of Definitely. you know so the blend of both your parents I think is good yeah. right it's good. Possibly, it's but good. still able to have fun right yeah I think it's a nice is a delicate balance to you know, so you, you mentioned that you grew up in Hackney. What was it like, like, obviously growing up in Hackney? So I'm an 80s yeah. baby. I'm giving away my age. But yeah, I'm an 80s baby. And um, at the time when I grew up, it was quite multicultural. So um, if I reflect upon like my school life, and again, I went to a school just like five minutes down the road from here. So yeah, like I had lots of friends from different cultures. I had lots of female friends as well. So there was like a, a bit of a gang of us growing up in school. And I think f being a, a girl child growing up in Hackney, it was a very different experience to maybe being a, a, a boy child. So mm. I think my brothers, I've got two older brothers, like I say, I think they probably had a, a tougher time in terms of, you know, influences, whether that be friends, whether that be incidences of having to deal with the police. I think their experience 
it, it is prob- has, was probably a bit tougher than mine. Yeah. And also in that household, we were the youngest as well. So um, there was always, you know, my mum would work a lot, but there was always like, a, I had an older brother who'd be mm. at home, you know, we came home from school and just made sure that we were kind of indoors. And and, yeah. uh, and when I say we, I mean, me and my twin sister. Yeah, I, I think th- I think the experience is probably different if, if you were a guy growing up in Hackney versus if you were a, a, like a female growing up in Hackney yeah. at the time when I was young. Yeah. But yeah, and it, it, I mean, it was nice. Like I said, I had a happy childhood, mm-hmm. but I just know, like, you know, if you look back on things that happened with family members, like in terms of encounters with police, in terms of influences of friends, it's very different. Yeah, yeah. fair enough, fair enough. And what was, what was school like for you? Were you into it? Were you into school at that time? Or Yeah, uh, I mean, I think, like I said, I had a good group of girlfriends, so it was just very fun. I was into like music and singing and dancing, mm. all of that kind. Of, very shy, but still loved all okay. of that kind of stuff. So when you're around your your girlfriends, that's what that's what you do. You get together and uh, listen to the latest latest songs and, mm. and dance and and all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, school was cool. Academic to a certain degree, I would say, but did struggle. <laughs> Okay. I think Why going think going struggled? through I think going through like primary school yeah. fine mm. get in towards secondary school get in towards the latter stages of that I think that's where I struggle. I just have a really short attention span okay. basically. Okay. I have a really short attention span. There was one stage where I was being um assessed for ADHD and then something happened and I still haven't gone back to finish that assessment basically right, okay. I mean I've written a book which is wonderful mm-hmm. and um I do all of these amazing things at this moment in time I'm studying uh, and I've been studying for quite some time I'm studying to become a, a qualified financial planner and advisor yeah. and it's not easy <laughs> it's yeah. not easy but I think that's just been the trajectory of my studying okay yeah I don't think I'm <laughs> You don't think you're into it like that's like your no, passion I th- project? Yeah, yeah. I, ha- I have challenges because my my mind is all over the place. That's just a creative though, right? That, that's what I think yeah, it is. That's a creative. <laughs> to me, that's a creative. Somebody, because yeah. I, would I say I have a short, I, I would say I have a, sh- a short attention span in terms of I get one idea yeah. and then I can get distracted and think of another yeah, idea yeah. and it's like this, 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 this. Yeah, this. I think yeah, that's one thing I've learned in, in having biz- in a, in running the business. Like, you know, I think when I started, it was like, I'm going to do this and this and this and this and trying to juggle like so many balls. And it's just like, no, let's try and do one, two, maybe three things really, really well. Yeah. And then move on to the next. Mm-hmm. Whereas, yeah. And it took me a while to just kind of, okay, calm down. Yeah. <laughs> calm yeah. down. <laughs> calm down a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Look, it's, it's the struggles of a creative, honestly. Yeah. Okay. So I want to talk about, you know, the motivation for starting Black Girl Finance. What, what was the motivation for it? I'd always had this idea to create something, create a space for women I'd had it for years um you know some previous iterations of that like me and my twin sister we did like a sister circle at some stage when we were both still in Hackney uh, with some friends and we'd get together and meet and it was just to create like a safe space and where it came to finance specifically as I'd kind of worked and gone through my career I'd learned more about investing so I used to have a colleague and he was very much into investing, investing in like Burberry shares and all of this kind of stuff. And it really piqued my interest. And so, yeah, just just at one stage, I decided that I wanted to create something. Wasn't sure what it was, but I think the seeds were planted, you know, when I was in at, at that job and having all of these conversations with that particular colleague of mine. And another thing was I grew up in a household that didn't speak about money. I don't know about you, what your mm-hmm. household was, was like, mm-hmm. uh, whether or not your parents were very open and honest with you about finances, but mine wasn't. And I don't think it's for any particular reason other than, you know, my mum was just working very hard, yeah. putting food on the table. She's made making sure that we're okay. But having the time to kind of stop and, you know, say, you know, this is how you budget, this yeah. is how you save, all of that kind of stuff. There's just no time. You're just getting on with life, yeah, yeah. basically. So I grew up with uh, grew up around a lot of silence around money. Um, I went on a bit of a journey myself, whereby you know I'd, I'd, I'd done okay. So was working in, in in like business development in sales. So doing okay. Um, in those types of environments, typically, you know, you you have a lot of people doing really well. So they might have the houses, they might have the cars. You know, yeah. they might be leading a good a good life. On paper, it looked like I was doing well, yeah. but financially, like I had no clue what I was doing. Okay. So even when I, you know, got on the property ladder and, you know, 
I always made sure that my son was well taken care of, always had food on food on the table and all of that. But there was just nothing left for myself because I wasn't taught those lessons around. OK, you're, you're going out into the workplace, you're working very hard, you know, and your money is not just to pay bills or just to consume. Do you know what I mean? So I really I, I had a period of time where I was really struggling and didn't know who to talk to about it as well. I think in the book, I reflect upon the fact that I lived in a house with like a sister and I was struggling financially, but I, I just couldn't tell her. You know, I couldn't tell her. I couldn't yeah. ask her for help. It was just really, really difficult. And eventually I had to kind of do that self-education and dig myself out of that hole. Yeah. And, and then, it, you know, there was a bit of a turning point where I had to kind of stop and actually look at my numbers, look mm. at my finances mm. and put things in place to do better. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get onto that, but like the things that you can do to do, you know, to feel better about money and, and, yeah. and maybe do better mm -hmm. uh, with finances. So yeah, on paper, it looked good, you know, on, pa yeah, and that, on that's paper. Often the, yeah, that's, that's often, often the case, yeah. right? You don't know what you don't know. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It yeah. looks good and you feel like you're doing okay. And then suddenly it's, you're just over indebted mm -hmm. maybe, or you're just, you know, you need to do something unexpectedly and there's no emergency yeah. ones available to do That's the worst ones, it. right? Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. the worst ones. I've, I've forgotten the question, but yeah. I, I was, oh, looks, motivation for starting Black Girl Finance. Oh gosh, yeah. I've gone on off, off on no, a tangent. No, no, no. I, I really <laughs> appreciate that, the fact that you're talking the background. I think it's yeah. important to how you got there, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. then I kind of, when I started to get better, I wanted to share the knowledge. And again, with mm. that seed planted of doing something, um, I wanted to do something. And then also just reading the statistics at the time, and, and some of them are in the book around, you know, the gender pay gap, the ethnicity pay gap that exists. It just really galvanized me to to create something. Mm -hmm. And it started off as just a, like a space, you know, we can join together on Zoom and talk about money. Okay, what's going on with you? Are you doing okay? What's gone really well? What's gone really bad? And then I realized that it needed a bit more structure, needed yeah. a bit of, you know, a bit of a formula to, to make it useful. And then we started to do the financial coaching piece. I then got offered uh, the book deal. So I, I was offered to write the book. And um, it's just kind of got grown from there. But it's, yeah. it's, it was definitely based on challenging that silence around money mm -hmm. um, that I grew up in. Also, you know, wanting to close some of those gaps that we see when it comes to, you know, the financial financial inequality. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are the kind of two main reasons. Yeah. 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 I love that. I love that. And uh, yeah, you've done well. You've done amazing. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, it's such a great job. And like I said, I, I feel honoured that I'm getting the chance to. Because um, when I first started, you definitely was one of the first. Was that? Like, wow, you're doing amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like looked up to that. So yeah, it's, it's, it's such an honour to, to have you on the podcast and for us to talk about your story. Thank you. Um, what, what do you feel has like, been the highlight of like Black Girl Finance for you? Oh, so many highlights. I think one of the highlights is speaking to women about money mm. and seeing their kind of progression. So yeah. um, in the Black Girl Finance book, there are case studies of women that I've worked with and the book came out in 2021. And since then, just talking to the women, you know, how things, how have things gone? And just, they're, they're just killing it. And even just the opportunity to speak to women who are just killing it in general. Yeah. So they, you know, they have good careers and they come to me because they want to now you know, figure out, okay, what, sh what should I be doing with my money? You know, yeah. I'm earning probably more than my parents' generation earned or, you know, I'm, you know, I'm maybe the, the breadwinner in the family. Mm -hmm. What do I, how can I manage my money? Because a lot of us have never been taught. It's just not one of those things that's accessible to people or yeah. not one of those things that you're taught in school. If you, again, grow up in a household like mine, whereby it, it wasn't really discussed, like, you know, where, where do we learn these these yeah. things from? You know, are we looking on social media? Uh, are we are we getting cues from our friends? Yeah. So I think um, one of the kind of highlights has been just having these conversations with women and just seeing their trajectory going from maybe having debt to then, you know, building up savings, making their first investment, mm -hmm. getting on the property ladder, just in, just encouraging people. OK, you want to get on the property ladder. You're, you're afraid there's something holding you back. You don't know um, who to speak to. Just speak to a broker. Look, yeah. just I, I'll introduce you. Just speak to this broker and they can just tell you, OK, what, what's yeah. possible. And I think sometimes we're afraid to take that that leap and that mm -hmm. jump and that step number one because we don't know we've never been taught we don't know who to speak to we've never been taught about it and it just seems like this big scary thing and often mm -hmm. it's not yeah it's scary because it's like you say we don't have the education and also it's like that fear of sometimes i think it's fear of like looking within yourself to be like oh actually yeah i'm not as good as i need to yeah. be yeah yeah right but then i feel like when you get to that point where you're like oh, okay i'm not as good as i 
need to be. Yeah, okay, you'll feel bad for a little bit, but then you know, okay, you can only you know go up from here, right? Yeah, you know where you're starting from. Yeah, like, if yeah. you don't know where you're beginning, yeah, if you don't know where you're starting from, where you are right now, how are you going to go and, 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 and yeah. get anywhere if, if you're just hiding from the reality yeah. of what's going on? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So, I want to talk a bit about the book. So, what Black Girl Finals book, make sure to go and get your copy. This is, I think I got this copy straight away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, I think it's I, the hardback is copy. It, it, That's oh, the first version that okay. comes out. Yeah. Oh, is that not <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. there's a paperback version. So okay, a year yeah. after you publish the, the, the hardback version, you then there's a paperback version. Is that what they version. do? Why is that? Why do they do that? I don't know. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. That's about. Um, okay, cool. So what can people expect from the book, obviously? Yeah, they, so it's know, a it's a really great personal finance book. So if you are into books that talk about, you know, how to work on your money mindset, how to budget, how to save, you know, your pension, it talks about investing, angel investing. Yeah. So it's a really good guide and I've set it out like I said earlier, with case studies. So you're not just um, hearing my story mm -hmm. um, around finance. You're hearing um, the story of other women who I've worked with. There's also an element of, it's called Black Girl Finance. I talk about the fact that I'm a, you know, Black Caribbean woman. Mm -hmm. Those are my roots, what it meant. So, you know, I mentioned in there the fact that my mum used to do something called a partner. It might be yes. called a susu. Yes. Um, that's how she used to, you know, save up for you know, she's raising five kids, single parent, how she used to save up for things like Christmas or the school uniform or even to get on the property ladder. Like yeah. my mum did that by herself. So um, I talk about a little bit about her uh, and being from a Black Caribbean household. And I think when um, the book came out, a lot of women from similar backgrounds found it really useful to see themselves within a book mm. that's talking about finance. Yeah, yeah so case studies guide so and again it's it, it gets you to do that self-examination okay mm -hmm. so you know what what do you currently think about when you think about money like what's your money mindset are you in debt right now what are the numbers how can you get out of debt so it talks about the debt snowball and the debt avalanche it talks about you know looking at your pension measuring your net worth mm -hmm. and, and that's something that you know the ordinary yeah. man and woman doesn't necessarily really do, do. Yeah, yeah yeah you yeah. think it's just for those who are rich and famous and, and have lots of wealth but again it's that principle of if you don't know where you're starting like how can you set goals about where you're going you know yeah. so you know looking at your net worth being brave looking at that number it might not be good now but you know in the future where do you want it to be yeah. so yeah lots of good practical tips around building building your confidence with money and then also building wealth yeah yeah i love that love that make sure to go and get your your copies of of the book um because yeah i think it's very important and i love the way that you you set out the book you're covering several topics right yeah. it's it's very you know jargon free and yes. that, i think that's yeah. an important thing we were talking about this like offline like how you know language is very important if you have if you speak in a way where it's like where it doesn't include people yeah especially finance finance is so, typically it doesn't include it's not honestly, inclusive right listen. so i love the fact that the book is is inclusive it's it's speaking an everyday language and it's you know providing examples i think it's very very important yeah. i wanted to talk about this part right so so you when we spoke you you mentioned black woman pay gap and you know a lot of the work that you're doing um is helping to close um that gap i guess why do you think that gap exists what's like some of the reasons for that some of the reasons are that we tend to be segregated in lower paid jobs. And I think, you know, segregation of, of the workforce is nothing, is, is not something new. So like men might be segregated in certain industries and, and, and women are segregated in certain industries as well. But I think what we see in addition to that is that women tend to be segregated in uh, or, or black black people tend to be segregated in, in workplaces that aren't as kind of high paying or yeah. they might be less stable. So maybe like zero hour contracts. So that's one one reason. Also, uh, there, there has been research to show that there is some bias and discrimination. So if you apply for a job and your name is more kind of African or maybe Asian sounding, you're less likely to you know be called for interview. Like there's research that shows that. And I think, again, when navigating through the workplace as women as well, childcare issues, you know, are you the main one that's supposed to give up your career as you, you navigate through your career? There's also research that says that women do ask for pay rises and they're not necessarily going to get them as much as men. So 
I think, you know, there is a gender pay gap. There is also an ethnicity pay gap. And when the two kind of intersect and, and then we can add on other, you know, um, you know, if we add on kind of disabilities as well, it all kind of intersects and it has a, a, a negative impact. And mm. if you're not getting that kind of pay rise or that same pay when you're starting your career, as you navigate through your career, that kind of scarring uh, kind of follows you through as well. Uh, and then and then mid career you might take time out of the workplace to care for yeah. for caring responsibilities as well so i think there's there's lots of reasons and yeah. um i def- i think we can't kind of dis- discount just you know unfair kind of i guess pay mm. practices and and, yeah. and and maybe a lack of opportunity to progress in mm-hmm. comparison to our counterparts yeah what do you think can be done about that then I think sh- being aware of it. So, yeah. you know, um, the first couple of chapters in the in the book, I, I speak about the impact of that pay gap. You know, it's, it's billions of pounds mm-hmm. that women are missing out on and, and those who are from, you know, a black Caribbean, um, Asian background, billions of pounds that we're missing out from. And that's money not going into pensions mm-hmm. to, to make us resilient when we come to, you know, later life. Uh, it's money that we don't have disposable yeah. income for now to be able to, you know, live the way that we want to live right now and I think being aware of it it means that people can then go into the workplace and they can make sure that they do things like negotiate their salary you know say rather than saying okay accepting the first offer you can say okay well what is you know what's the budget for this role and and if it suits what you want to get go for it um another thing is um maybe move in jobs. I think people who move jobs, it's shown that they they earn, um, move jobs more regularly, maybe every two or three years, they end up with a higher salary yeah. over their career. So I think being aware of the issues, also being aware of how you navigate your career and family life and, yeah. you know, relationship as well. Even if it's doing things such as, you know, if you're taking time off for childcare, can your partner mm. pay into your pension for you? It's just these these things that make a difference but being aware is is i think is key and advocating for yourself when you're navigating your your career um is is important and also advocating for yourself when Mm. you're in a relationship yeah i think is key i think those are the things we can do personally i think you know government and other authorities (laughs) no one's coming to save us you know if you look at the history of pensions and and all sorts no yeah (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's and we're going to talk a little bit about this later is the importance of like you say financial planning i like the fact that you said um and i never really even thought about that like you know your partner paying into your pension because you, obviously you can get like private pension yeah. but that's a good point because if you're fam if you're if you're financially if you're financially planning together yes yeah then you can look okay actually i can afford to put some you're going to take off yeah. some time off work to yeah. look after you i can afford to yeah put money that's the that's, conversations yeah that that's why you have having. to have these conversations yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. yeah so actually talking on that note of family <laughs> planning right yeah so women are often affected by it right yeah and um so it can affect their careers um thus impacting um their their income H- how can they kind of mitigate that because yeah. i know that's a i know that's a worry especially if you're doing very well in your career but you know at some point you want to have kids mm-hmm you know, you're going to have to take some time off and you yeah. know that it kind of stores things a little bit for you. Yeah, I think I think it's being aware of of all of the options, you know. So um, I work with clients right now. And I mean, I think what we tend to see is, is a bit more of, you know, when it comes to children and childcare, it, the, the, the burden or the emphasis is, is for that to be the responsibility mm-hmm. of, you know, the female of the relationship, basically, or the woman in the relationship. And I think maybe just shifting that dynamic a, a little bit and um one example was the pension but at the same time as well is there some benefit that your partner can get through work you know can they claim the child care allowance that's available to them instead of yourself can they do some of the pickups and the drop-offs you know are there are are their name is their name down as the emergency contact should something happen so I think you can navigate these things within your relationship so it's a bit more equitable. Mm. So I think that's a big thing. So, you know, you're important within the relationship. Yes, you're a mum, but your career is also important if that's what's important to you because there will be some women who, you know, they have a baby, they want to take time out and that's what they want to focus on and they should be able to do that and they shouldn't be criticised for for doing that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there might be a woman who just has to work 
or just wants to work. And yeah. again, I think that shouldn't be criticised either. That should be that should be supported. I think we live in a time, a day and age where, you know, to, to be, I, I mean, I did an article for the blog about the single tax. It's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> it's expensive. Yeah. If you are, you know, if you are by yourself, you know, running a household, far less raising a family, it's super, super expensive. So, you know, I think if you are coupled up, you need to be considerate of each other, you need to be considerate of each other's careers, you know, career trajectory, you know, get you someone that's going to, you know, be by your side and truly support you before kind of having babies. Yeah. Them, basically. <laughs> for real, for yeah. real. Because, yeah, I mean, like, like we, we, we again, we're going to talk a bit later that planning right together yeah. obviously financially career wise all this yeah. you have to just have these conversations we Absolutely. have to have these conversations yeah. right yeah. to see what works because some people might be like look my career is very important to me mm -hmm. So you have to have these conversations yeah. before you get to the situation. Like, oh, what's going on now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and no, you can't do this. And uh, yeah, and I think um, often yeah. another thing that we see with regards to that is like often, you know, a woman's pay check is is to fund mm. all of the family, including mm. the childcare and including the child's children's clothes and the food and making sure everyone's okay. Yeah. And maybe the man's paycheck is for themselves. And I mm. think, again, you know, come on, scrap that. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not in like the 1950s. Yeah. You know, women are working. You like, yeah. it's like I said, it's it's tough out here. Cost of living crisis. If you're both working, both contribute to to exactly. everything. Yeah, I completely completely agree with that. On that note, right? So, uh, so we had uh, Natalie on uh, the episode recently, or her episode actually came out this week, and uh, so she mentioned that many women are are martyrs, right? Uh, women martyrs, and mothers yeah. are like yeah. martyrs, right? Uh, so they give more than they can. Yeah. So that got me thinking, how can, I guess, you know, women that are martyrs, women and mothers that are martyrs, mm. how can they be a bit more balanced so mm -hmm. that they're, you know, they're hitting their financial goals and yeah. they're working towards it? I think you have to know that you are doing that. And I think, you know, we're, we're very fortunate that we live in a time where you can go online and you can learn about your yeah. kind of money mindset or your kind of financial habits, something called habitudes. So your kind of habits with money and your attitudes to money. So you can be aware of what your kind of financial mindset is. Yeah. And a lot of the times there's a reason why we have that mindset. So for example, if you are a martyr, Sometimes you're using the fact that you're kind of helping, you know, someone. Maybe it could be because you you want you're you're trying to please someone. You want them to, you know, like you. Or but sometimes it could be you are using you're using that finances the finances to you know get something from them, like to to keep them tied to you. And I think we really need to understand our financial mindsets, um, understand where they come from on a deeper level. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've got examples of uh, kind of women in my life who I would say are, you know, financial martyrs. And I feel like if you look at the long term impact on their kind of finances now that they may be retired, I feel like, you know, they 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 probably would say themselves that they would have been a lot more further along if they'd been a bit more selfish if they put themselves mm. first a bit more when it comes to their finances. Yeah. And I think um, that's one of the things that we have to do. Mm. I think we're, we're, we, as women, we, we, we grow up and we're taught to value, you know, getting that career, which is a, a positive thing. We're taught to value maybe being in a relationship and, and marriage and maybe judged if you're not, if you don't have those things. Mm -hmm. One thing that we're not taught to kind of value and, and think about is how we're doing financially and, yeah. our, and, and our money and getting our money up and building wealth. And I think there needs to be a change so that, you know, there's that equality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we look at kind of the pension pots of men versus women. And again, if we kind of segregate that into uh, when if we break it down to race, you know, I remember when I was writing the book, I saw a report from Age UK that showed the risk factor for being, you know, for pensions poverty yeah. was, you know, being from an ethnic mi minority background, being a woman, maybe being unmarried and living in social housing. Those were the things that 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 were a kind of risk factor. And I think um, it's clear if you're not taught to prioritise it uh, and it doesn't have to be prioritised in a, in a way of, you know, in a capitalist. Yeah, um, it's, it's you know, all, it's like, me, that's me, what you me, think buy, about. Buy, yeah. buy, consume, yeah. consume, consume. <laughs> type of way yeah. it's just you know just to make sure you're okay and yeah. and your family are okay mm. i don't think there's anything wrong with that yeah um yeah yeah it's it's yeah it's uh it's very interesting and it takes me on to the point of 
uh, you mentioned the pension gap, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I saw that you did a you, you did a bit of a piece with uh, Scottish widows, right? Where they were basically saying that uh, black women are more likely to reduce their working hours instead of retiring yeah. versus their uh, counterparts. Um, and then it say on that same note, black and Asian women are opting out of pension schemes that they don't think that they could afford. Citing pension awareness gap, concerns about comfortable retirement, not being able to afford it, preferring to save money in other ways, and lack of trust in a pension scheme. Yeah. Um, yet they they are working multiple jobs, which yeah. was very interesting. So I guess why do you think there's that lower pension awareness amongst uh, black women, and why is there a lack of trust? I guess for. Yeah, I think pension schemes, if you look at our history as a community with the banks and building society, with the financial system, mm. it's very different mm. than, than you know, our, our, our counterparts. I think, you know, the system wasn't designed for us. In fact, you know, things like credit unions, things like the partner scheme and all of that, they were a direct result or built as a direct result to being excluded from the financial system. So I think, you know, a bit of a, bit of a lack of trust, that idea that, you know, you, you'd rather, you know, hoard your finances or hoard your money under your your mattress and then put it in a bank I think it has legitimate roots for our generation less so like we've we've grown up in a, a time whereby um we trust uh you know we trust the banks and building societies although one of the um case studies is in the, in the book is of someone whose their bank account was just completely closed on them and it tends to happen to people mm-hmm. of you know certain demographics more than others so i think you know again for, for sometimes the trust the trust lack of trust is 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 reasonable yeah and then the the idea of just kind of working rather than you know retiring i think it's 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 probably the the roots stem from probably a lack of planning yeah you know if you've not been encouraged or taught to put yourself first when it comes to your finances you know unfortunately it does mean that when you do come to retirement and if we're talking about people like you know my mum's generation and and you know um that generation it's it's not it's not unexpected I guess given like the history the history of their opportunities their history the history of you know, their opportunities to save, especially if you are, you know, a woman that's been a martyr mm-hmm. all your life, whilst, yeah. you know, whilst going through your career, you're, mm-hmm. you're not going to prioritise it. So I think it's, 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 it's sad, it's unfortunate, but I think we have an opportunity now with, you know, you know, platforms such as yours, yeah. talking about it, educating people about the importance of things like pensions, you know, building that awareness. I think we have the opportunity to kind of change that and make it better for the, for future generations. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah, I agree. We yeah we 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 do, we do actually have the opportunity. And I guess you know, what would your be your message for those people that maybe there's some watchers, listeners. I hope I hope not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hope not. Yeah, that don't believe that they should contribute to pension and to be fair i'm saying this with fairness i remember when i was younger i i did not know what pension was yeah, neither did I. <laughs> and i was like why am i giving money to this thing yeah. what is this thing i don't need this this is um i ain't 60 yeah yeah you know you do think it's like yeah. something that you need yeah it's yeah. like something that you start worrying about a bit later yeah something that you start worrying about um you know it's for old people yeah, yeah that's that people. was what i was yeah. thinking i'm like i'm in my young 20s why am i yeah. Why, well, what's you this? might need the money. Need this you're thinking, money now, yeah, right? you need it now. You need it in your pocket now to go and you know do something frivolous with it right yeah. now. If we're honest, but I think my message would be: if you're a young person, you've got your first career. And the thing is, it's about the habit. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's it's about having that habit. It's about having that understanding that yes, you are out there. You're going for your. You know, you've got your first career. It's exciting. Suddenly, you may. You know, you've gone from struggling at uni or whatever mm. you know struggling and then suddenly you've got all of this money yeah. I think um it's really important just to understand that you need to keep some of that money back for yourself number one you know that that idea of paying yourself first I think if you get into that habit of paying yourself first putting some money aside for yourself I think that will last you for a lifetime because yeah. if you can't let's think about it, if you think about it, you if you can't save you can't invest because there's nothing for you to there's no capital for you to invest in the first place so if you build up that habit of saving and pension is a route a pension is a route to do that there's other benefits as well with with pensions you know it's a tax efficient way of, of building up funds uh, kind of for the future it's a kind of tax deferred but still you know, you pay in, typically your employer pays in, you get um, tax relief on it as well. So it's a really efficient way of building for your future. And I think a lot of us don't recognise that. So my message would be, which was your question, 
just get into your pension scheme. Yeah. Even if you're just putting in, you know, the bare minimum to begin with, just be mindful to ramp it up as you, you know, get those pay increases, yeah. pay rises, but just be in the scheme. Mm -hmm. Like I was speaking to some, uh, some friends of mine who are older than me and, you know, one of them who, you know, he was talking about, the fact that he had out of all of his friends he had put into his pension and um you know so he's laughing he's at the he's at the stage where he's you know he's got his business he's got his uh pension you know, you know he's got his business his business is doing well he doesn't have to touch that pension but it's money there you know and compared to his his friends and peers yeah. you know they had nothing left mm. and it was just something that you just set and forget yeah almost mm. so yeah, I think it's a real opportunity to mm -hmm. to start building wealth and mm -hmm. you know building wealth as as quickly as possible. So think about it. Yeah, I think it's important. Opt into it. And you know what I realize? A lot of people don't know that. I don't want to get too into the technicalities too much, but y your pension can also be for other people in the future as well. Yeah, a lot absolutely. of people don't think about that yeah. perspective. It's not only for you; it's it can be not, for other people. Yeah, it's, you know, it's it for your generation. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. make up. I don't think your pension makes up part of your like estate. So when you pass away, you know, um, it doesn't make up part of your estate. You can give it to somebody. Like you can mm. give it to your child. You can yeah. give it to your grand. You can nominate it for somebody, so they benefit. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. a really good tool. It is. It is. <laughs> and if you think about, you know, in the UK, like I, I get emails all the time <laughs> talking about like inheritance tax, um, and and like the receipts, and it's just going up. The government's taking so much from from us <laughs> in inheritance. You when you live, yeah. they'll tax you before you you're born. Yeah. Where you live, and then after so you're much, gone, <laughs> so much from you, and it's the vehicle where which which is is outside of that. So you yeah. need to use it. Yeah. yeah. It's so smart. So, okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, we were talking a little bit about the stress of money and, you know, not knowing where you, you kind of stand with it. So, um, so I read that Moneybox, they, um, they did a, they quiz about 4,000 adults, right. And nearly 47% of them, um, admitted, admitted to having uh, money based regrets causing them to have stress related to finance. Mm -hmm. Uh, 20, some 28, uh, percent of those surveys said they stress finance has caused them to uh, be stressed and then 27 percent said uh, this financial strength uh, stress had uh, negatively affected their mental health yeah. so i guess again for anyone listening watching you know stressing about money yeah um or personal finance in general what would be your message to them yeah, I would say, you know, for the ones that spoke about regrets, financial regrets, I mean, we can't go backwards. We can only go forwards. Yeah. So I think, you know, you have to do a lot of forgiving yourself if you've, you know, messed up royally with your finances. And, and everyone has. Like, there's not, yeah. a, there's not a person in the world who hasn't made a financial mistake, Definitely. you know, because ultimately you, you make a decision with, with the knowledge that you have at the time. And you, you make a best, you know, a best decision at the time, a best choice. Um, and that's all we can do as human beings. So. You know, in terms of having regrets for things that you've maybe missed out on or financial mistakes, I would say, forgive yourself. Don't beat yourself up. There's no point. There's just li like literally no point. It's if you, you know, have had a bad boyfriend or a bad girlfriend, like we can't go back. It's just life lessons. What mm -hmm. can you learn from that? You know, that, that's what you should be focused on, not beating yourself up. That's yeah. more, more, more worthwhile to be doing. In terms of, uh, you know, money causing financial stress, I think we're quite fortunate that, you know, we've gone through COVID and the pandemic. And I think, you know, um, you know, there, there's such a thing as the vulnerable customer. I think whereas before, if you were struggling with finances, there were people that could get away yeah. with kind of hunting you down, chasing you down, you know, lots of bad practices. We live in a time whereby there is something, you, you know, you, you, you can be a vulnerable customer. These banks and building societies or whoever you owe should have processes in place to treat you fairly, to give you an opportunity to you know, get yourself on, on more steadier terms. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's easy. It's very, it's very awkward conversations to go and have with these, you know, with people that you owe money to, with your creditors. But at the same time, there, there are processes in place. Don't kind of be railroaded. Understand your rights. And that's one of the things that I spoke about in the book. You need to understand your rights. And that could mean, you know, speaking to different organisations. You might speak to, you know, in the UK, um, if you're in the UK, you might speak to the Citizens Advice Bureau. You might speak to Step Change. Um, and just, just, just knowledge yourself up. Because even though you may be struggling financially, financial institutions and firms should have processes in place yeah. to allow you to 
you know, you might get a like a bit of a breathing space whereby, you know, they're not charging you any interest or, you know, they're not constantly charging you or contacting you just to give you a bit of, give you an opportunity to kind of get back in a better position. Mm-hmm. So I think I would just kind of clue myself up um, and just be honest with these organisations if things are going wrong and try and come to some sort of agreement yeah, and, and kind of face it. And it's very, very difficult to do. It is, yeah. It's, yeah, it's the, the hardest thing to do. But um, I think just being honest with your, your circumstances yeah. and situations is, is the best thing you can possibly do. Yeah. I've got a question for you. Yeah. How, what did you tell yourself to face it? What did you tell yourself yeah. to be like, yeah, I'm going to now finally address and tackle this i think i just i think unfortunately i got to a stage where i just couldn't run from it anymore you know there was there's only so many times i could not open a letter that's telling me okay you know you're overdrawn here or you know you you're you're a few months behind here and then so many kind of times the the phone could ring and you're missing it do you know what i mean you're you're actively avoiding it like (laughs) it literally just got yeah it literally just got to crunch time where it was just like you know i have to do something different like i have to deal with it and i'll tell you something like the weight of relief off my shoulder when i kind of spoke to whoever it was that i owed money to and just set up a you know a repayment plan like it was better than running do you know what Mm. i mean it's it's better than running and hiding and dodging and diving yeah um just just having something simple set up so I think even for me on my journey you know there's been highs there's been lows kind of fearing having to explain a situation to someone and say look this is where I am this is what I can this is all I can afford (laughs) you know take it or take nothing (laughs) you know take it I think you know we're we're, we're in a very empowered place more empowered place than we give ourselves credit for yeah it's funny when you face something like the like you say the weight off your shoulder yeah like your worst fears are not it's, it's very yeah. rarely that what you fear is what's actually going to come to yes, pass a hundred percent a hundred percent and again it's about it's about once you clue yourself up on on these things you'll realize again it's just knowing that there are processes like yeah. these organizations will have processes in place um, and again, I think, like I said, we went through COVID where, you know, everyone was struggling. Yeah. They had to put processes in place to, to to help. So, you know, I think, yeah, and you're right. I think our worst fears are often, it's, it's often not as bad as what we really fear. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a bit about financial planning. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when I hear it, I don't know. It's like... It, you know it sound it does sound intimidating it sounds yeah. a little bit like what's financial planning i mean from your perspective what is financial planning yes yeah, you know yeah so financial planning is, is is it's like exactly what it says on the tin it's kind of like planning your finances planning ahead so that you can build wealth mm. and even pass on wealth so we're not talking about well, well, there's a little bit of resilience in there so so you know building up those habits that make you financially resilient which is great. It's a great foundation to start with. But beyond that, let's think about how we can build wealth. Like what what are assets? What are liabilities? What's going to get your net worth? Like I mentioned, I talk about the net worth in the book. What's going to get your net worth truly growing? What type of behaviours are going to do that? So it's it's planning to to build wealth, Mm. basically. Yeah. And then how does someone go about like what's like some of the first or the building blocks of financial planning yeah so I think getting into the habit getting into the mindset of again paying yourself first and that is to build up that emergency fund Mm. so if something goes wrong if you're unable to work you've got a safety net and a lot Mm. of us don't have that like whenever I do a a talk or a workshop I always ask people you know if 800 pounds and and to your viewers listening you know if suddenly 800 pounds or 800 dollars or whatever it is um was suddenly missing from your bank account will you be okay like, will your salary be, you know, allow you to cover all of your expenses? Or yeah. would you end up going to take out more debt or borrowing from a, you know, a, a, a source that you shouldn't be borrowing from and become indebted to someone else to to handle that? And I think, you know, life lives, mm. you know, yeah, whether life, it life, is, yeah. whether <laughs> it is, you know, the stuff that we've seen over the last few years with the cost of living crisis, you know, suddenly people's mortgages have doubled, tripled. Mm. Yeah. Suddenly people's, you know, gas and electricity bills have, have doubled and tripled you know can you handle that yeah so those are kind of and these are macro things that have nothing to do with us like you and I as an ordinary person we've not done anything Mm -hmm. but yet we have been impacted do you know what I mean we're just minding our business 
going to work, doing what we've usually done. And then there's some conflict causing all yeah. of this stuff that really impacts yeah. us. And then there's that side of things. And then there's also the stuff that happens to you personally. Like if you were unable to work due to being ill or, you know, maybe you had to take time off to, to care for a relative, like, would, would you be okay? And, um, you know, a lot of us, we wouldn't be, mm -hmm. you know, some of us will be, which is great, great position to be in. A lot of us won't be. And I think the first step of planning is to build up that kind of, think about the worst, I don't, you know, we don't want to sit around thinking about the worst case scenario, but think about the worst case scenario and, and how would you cover it? Like, yeah. yeah, it's very, 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 very important. And I think some people as well, like, I think the emergency fund is, it's, it's often it is often overlooked to be fair yeah because that emergency like you say anything can happen a car breakdown yeah. uh, i don't know you need to travel somewhere for somewhere yes. and we do us, yeah. us, for our community we could be yeah. back you know we might need to go back home yeah. next week you know yeah. for something it's expensive it's, it's listen <laughs> <laughs> it's so expensive it's not cheap yeah. at all you know or Financial flexibility. I also see it as like emergency fund. What if you you know you want to start your business? And you're like, you yes. know what? I need six months, twelve months yes. off. Yes. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because you don't have that. So yeah. it's, it gives you all of that, and I think it's it's often overlooked. I, I mean, it's your money at the end of the day as well. It is, yeah. Know? And that, and I think it's getting into that habit of keeping some money back for ourselves. We yeah. can't always just be consumers. We're not here to just pay British gas. We're not here to just play <laughs> Zara. You know, we need to. What, what like what do you want to do, Atta? What do I want to do? Yeah. And I think um, you saying that it just triggered a thought for me. I would not be here speaking to you yeah. if I hadn't got into the habit of paying myself some money of saving mm. like literally saving has allowed me to i was interested in tech so i was i ended up working at a um like a software company and i got interested in like websites because we used to do a little, little very tiny bit of coding um to help our customers and when i was thinking about creating black girl finance i was like okay i'm gonna need to to know how to do all of this stuff no you don't but it, it, back then it was like oh i'm gonna need to learn how to do this stuff and i had started to like, like i said once i'd sorted out you know a debt repayment that meant that the rest of the money was mine and i could divide up how I wanted and one of the things that I did was pay myself get back into my pension because it was a, a, a long period of time where I wasn't paying into a pension I wasn't like you wasn't paying attention to it it's mm. like it's too young you know this is mm. not for now so pension was sorted and then I and I, I was doing well financially in terms of work-wise career-wise I could save I could yeah. save money after all of the bills were paid and I started putting money aside and it just meant that when I decided okay, I'm going to launch Black Girl Finance, I could go and do a, like an evening course yeah. and on web design and learn how to code. Not that I code now, but it was something that I did yeah. and it gave me the confidence to build the website right in the book. I'm not, a, I'm not, you know, I don't know. I don't have all for friends. Like mm. I did, well, I, did, I do now. I didn't have all for yeah. friends when I was thinking, okay, I'm, I've created Black Girl Finance. I want to write a, a book about money. But I was able to kind of research and just pay like an online course yeah. to learn how to, it was a, like creating an ebook. And um, from that small ebook, you know, it was about a bud budgeting ebook, a publisher read that ebook mm -hmm. and they were like, oh, would you like to write a book? And I was like, yeah. You know, this is what I was planning all along. But I always say, if I hadn't have started to use money in a way that like valued myself, I wouldn't be here. Like yeah. I would still be doing my nine to five. I don't know if I would be happy or not. Who knows? And mm -hmm. I just know that when I took the leap to work at Black Girl Finance full time, I was very miserable yeah. there. Okay. So you're right. It's, it allows you to have opportunities. Mm -hmm. It allows you to decide, okay, well, this is not serving me anymore. Let mm -hmm. me go and do this instead. Mm -hmm. Like it's a, it's a really empowered place to be. Yeah. So why wouldn't you want to be in that place? Mm -hmm. And um, I think just making that one decision just to say, look, my check comes in, I'm going to save 10% for, like you can call it a rainy day fund, an opportunity fund. It just means you've got more more wiggle room, like you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's very, very important. So can we talk about the, in, the, the importance of taking small steps consistently instead of like yeah. big inconsistent steps? Absolutely, yeah. and it's the habit. It's that yeah. habit, it's, that, yeah. it's training that muscle. It really is like... I probably started saving like maybe like 25 pounds a, a month or mm. uh, yeah, probably like 25 pounds. That's how I started, you know, and I probably had to cut back on a few things to be able to do that. But it just started small. And then as I, you know, increased my salary through work, um, you know, our salary kind of peaks, I think, at around the age of like 40, um, maybe 40-ish for both men and women. I think I don't know if men's salary peak is 
is a bit higher. So, you know, if imagine you're, you're 22 or 30, there's still time, you know, there's mm. still time to, to, to earn extra income, to create more yeah. disposable income, you know, through salary. And as you earn more, save more, you know, mm -hmm. what we tend to do is as we earn more, we spend more. You know, we upgrade everything. But if you're, what you need to understand is if you're upgrading everything, you know, to the same level that you're earning, you're no better off. You're no, you're, you're no better off. You know, what's going in is coming out. It's exactly the same. You're no better off. So we need to start, you know, once we you know, get opportunities to earn more money, put some of that away, put more of it away and, and, and focus on building assets and building your net worth um, rather than just spending it. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think I think that's the thing, right? It's like it's that it's that lifestyle inflation. I get it. I, it I, is. I, I get it as well. I've done it. You get the cars. You want to get the nice. I get it. We all get the watches, <laughs> the bags, the holidays. Yeah. You know. I think it's. Um. I think again, it's balance, right? You can do maybe. 50 50 okay maybe i'll upgrade the i get a pay rise okay 50 percent can go to yeah why you not know, invest yeah, that's, that's in 50 fine. to that i'm but happy with that yeah upgrade <laughs> exactly everything is upgraded <laughs> yeah 100 percent upgraded no let's, oh, let's man. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's yeah I, I do agree i think it's it's getting into that habit and it's important not to compare yourself to, to other people yeah. just be on your own journey especially in like this day um of social media i think it could be a bit tough because Maybe you're, maybe you, you starting off like smaller, ten pounds here and there, yeah. and you're seeing somebody else in there. Yeah, they look like they're doing their, better their financially. Grand that they saved. <laughs> exactly. Some people do ten grand a month, whatever it is, yeah. right? But like you say, I think it's that consistency. Consistency over time always wins. Exactly. Hundred percent. You know, yeah. Know? So what's what's that uh, thing? The tortoise beats the hare. That's true. Yeah. That is yeah. always so true. So. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's mad. Um, so, what what three lessons do you think uh, when it comes to manage uh, when it comes to money management should everyone follow? Yeah, so I know I banged on about putting yourself first and saving mm. first and all of that. So that's my key one because nothing changes unless you do something different, and yeah. that could be the small thing that you do that's yeah. different that's gonna kind of move the dial a bit. I think also tackling debt. I think a lot of us and 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 and. It's our fault because we have choices, <laughs> but we are very much influenced. Like, you know, debt is everywhere. You can buy your and, and eat your delivery, you know, through Klarna or, you know, pay it off, you know, in free free payments. You know, that's that's how much debt is has become a part of just the norm and every day. And I think um, I think debt is good. I think there's a way of leveraging debt for for good. You know, we do it when we study and I think we're fortunate in the UK although it's very expensive now but we are fortunate in the UK in in how we kind of pay it back you know you need to earn a certain amount and you know it gets wiped off after a certain time and it doesn't impact your your credit score so that's an example you know you're you're taking out some debt to to study to hopefully have mm. that career that's going to give you the the salary that you want so you yeah. can live the life that you want or it could be you know want to get on the property ladder you need to get a mortgage to do that you might you know get a mortgage to do a buy to let property first of all or, yeah. or some sort of a property strategy scheme and those are good ways of leveraging debt so I'm not saying that debt is all bad but if it's just debt just for you know to help out a friend or to you know help out a partner or to you know do something frivolous with it you know don't do it you know there's, there's better ways getting into that habit of building up that state those savings to do things and and that's essentially what financial planning is and we speak to clients all the time and it's it you know you can hear the panic in their voice you know they want to go and do something and and or or you know there's some some you don't know some financial responsibility that's owed and getting them to shift their habits so they're making plans for it like you know a year a year or two ahead you know is key mm rather than just always just being on the treadmill of, of, of debt. Yeah, I think the savings piece is, is key because if you can save, you can then invest. And I think that would be my last point, investing, particularly as women, as, particularly as black people, we need to be investing in assets. There's such an opportunity out there to, you know, earn returns from investing in assets rather than, you know, investing in, in liabilities, you yeah. know. 
and this thing and, and, and assets are things that you can actually pass on to others you know liabilities you can't you know I've had experience of bereavement I lost my partner and what what happens and I've seen it firsthand is you know all of the stuff that you buy mm. eventually it just gets you know someone's got to do something with it and and it might go to charity it might not you know so I think you know you, you can't pass on like stuff clothing and you know, mm. um, I often hear Emmanuel Sucro say whenever he does talks, you know, you can't pass on like your wigs and your gele and, and it cracks me up. Look, but you can't. Yeah, or you, you I mean, can't you can pass, pass it on, on no, but there, no. there's going to come a point where, you know, no mm. one's going to value it. It's not going to be. It, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I think being really mindful of um, kind of what we're, what we're buying. Is it, is it an asset? Is it a liability? I think assets investing is, is key. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And uh, it takes us on to the next point about, you know, building wealth and generational wealth, because I feel like they're two different things. Obviously, generational wealth is like over generations building wealth. I, I feel like that's in your lifetime and that's for you and, you know, your family. Um, <laughs> it's so funny that you said that you can't pass things over time because you know what? It got me thinking, like when you think about clothes, you know, like how clothes are in season, right? Yeah. And they go out of seasons. Every you you buy something maybe 100, 200 pounds. It's even sometimes people will buy stuff 100, 200 pounds. I've actually done this before. I bought. <laughs> I'm gonna say this. Yeah, I'm gonna say it. I bought. I remember when I was young. I bought a. I think it was 300 pounds. Yeah. yeah. Prada shoes. I think I wore them like three or four yeah. times. I mean, just sitting there. <laughs> I'm sure we've all got stories. I remember going. I've, I I went on like a, a like one of my first holidays. I remember buying. I couldn't really afford it, but I remember buying some like ex designer sunglasses, and I swear to God, they were lost in the first week that I had them. They were lost. They were gone. They were. I don't even. I. I don't know where they were, and I. I could barely afford it. But you know, you. you I don't know. You just. I don't even get caught up in the mood, or I think if so, I. Yeah. If I was just like <laughs> trying to stunt and and show, yeah, you know, I can afford this yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> um, but they were go like they were gone so quickly. I was just like, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> I'm never ever doing that again. Yeah, I just yeah. you know, and we're also susceptible. We're also yeah, susceptible we are, to it. Yeah, like I'm yeah. here as a finance coach, but there there, there are there are moments. Mm. There are moments where you know I want to you know show out and and maybe stunt and, but at the same time, like I have to just be aware of okay, if I do that, you know, what is the benefit? What is the true benefit of mm. doing that? You know, I might feel good for the moment, but longer term, when I'm you know, having to make decisions around, okay, this gets paid or that gets paid. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not going to feel good. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I agree. I think it's balance, right? Like mm -hmm. like you say, if you're struggling to get that thing, I mean, for me, I mean, it, it provide use because I didn't really use it. So I didn't yeah, make yeah, yeah. the yeah. use of it. And uh, I'm but like, did you sell them on? I still got them. Oh, you still got them? Okay. <laughs> you're just are, they, are, right. they, are they increasing in value? <laughs> I don't know. I need to check. Maybe. I mean, t I don't think people wear them anymore. Okay. I think back then people was wearing yeah, them. Yeah. So I was like, now they're out of season. Then I spent all that money is out of yeah, season. Yeah. I, mean, I was young. It yeah. was like, you know, it is, <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. Um, what, what do you think are some of the biggest factors stopping someone from, you know, most people want to build wealth. What do you think are some of the biggest factors stopping someone from achieving that? I think it's just choices that we make. I, I do I do think it's choices that we make. I was having a conversation with someone and they were saying we're in a prison and I was like, you know, like the system's not designed for us to kind of thrive and flourish and, and all of that. I'm like, yeah, okay, things are hard, but we have a choice. Like we have a choice. We We can educate ourselves and become aware of how the world works, how things are. And we can we can we can go against the grain, you know. You having this massive podcast is probably not the traditional thing that you know the previous generation would have wanted you to do, or maybe encourage you to do. But I think we we have so much opportunity to do things in a in a unique way. So I think it's about making making a choice. So that would be the first thing. And then secondly is getting educated. Like there's so much financial literacy information out there. You have to kind of test the, the source. You do have to, you know, be do your due diligence of it. But there's so much information out there. Like, you know, we can open up, you know, our phone. We can download an app and get educated. Like I really love the the kind of apps that are out there right now whereby, you know, you can you can like a couple of apps that I really like. There's a your Juno app mm -hmm. and there's also Female Invest. And there's so many wonderful platforms out there. 
you know, Emmanuel Sucre's platform, mm -hmm. your guests, mm -hmm. you know, they're all doing that financial education yeah. piece. Yeah. So there's so much valuable information out there to allow you to, to educate yourself. You can be the first, like just because, you know, none of your friends are doing it or maybe yeah. your parents didn't do it, your family didn't do it. You can be the first to do that. And I think being lifelong learners about this topic is, is, is key. And then taking action and actually actually executing yeah. what you're learning. Because a lot of us will read a book and, and not do anything. Or mm -hmm. we might, you know, join a, a workshop or join a class and not do anything. Yeah. But um, actually taking action. And again, that comes with the mindset. It's about being able to take that next step. Mm. You know, um, I think those, those that, that's what I would say. Yeah. So how do you feel like somebody can go about, you know, building wealth? They're, they're listening to podcasts. You know, they've heard us talk about investing in pension. They've heard us talk about, you know, pay yourself first. How can somebody go about like, you know, yeah. building wealth? Put into practice, <laughs> take whatever's in your bank account, <laughs> do your budget. Actually, I, I wouldn't say just, just take the money and just save it or just take it and invest it. Do your budget, work out how much you can invest, even if it's a small amount. Like we, The beautiful thing about this time is that you can start investing from like one pound. I've got an app on my phone called Wealthify. I can invest from one pound, like you can do that. Like you can start doing, get in the game, you know, just do it basically, I would say. Yeah. What's your definition of generational wealth? I think it's not just the finance, financial things. Um, it's not just the, 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 the money and having the money and passing on the money because, you know, we've all heard of those occasions where, you know, someone's inherited money and it's just gone. In fact, I'll, you know, I'll be honest, like I think when my um, gran, she used to live around here in Hackney, when she, my gran and granddad, they came over here, worked very hard and then they decided to move back home to Barbados and my dad's mum. And um, when she moved, she gave like the grandkids some money. Yeah. I think it was maybe like £2,000. And, you know, I knew nothing about what to do with that. So that was gone <laughs> really, really Fair. quickly. And I know it's only a small amount of money, but any, you know, when, if you don't have the lessons of what to do with it, like, you know, I could have been taught to just put it into the bank. I think back then there weren't like high interest savings accounts like there are now. Or well, there were, the interest wasn't so high, I mean. But I could have, I could have just put it, you know, I could have just put it somewhere, put it, yeah. even if I just put it in a, a, a bank with some interest or I could have invested it maybe, but I had no clue. And, and that money was, was probably there one day and, and gone probably by the end of the month because there's no education. So I think education is key. So I'm, I, you know, I'm a mom, I've got a son, like my son, whenever he wants to do anything financial, he'll come and talk to me. So okay, I've got him that. investing. I've got him saving and he's still got the bougie lifestyle he likes his nice things yeah, but he's still doing the <laughs> yeah, right things though. but he still has some investments yeah, you know so I'm, I'm happy about that and even just like my nephew he's now got a son as well and i'm just like you know save you know invest for yourself invest for your your child as well so i think it's that education piece mm -hmm. that's 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 key and that's about you know that's my definition of of building generational wealth it's yeah. not just the money because you want to make sure that once they've got the money they know what to do with it mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it's very very important you're right because like you say they can get all the money like That's what it, am i doing with it i get yeah. a million yeah look exactly. you can spend a million yeah. in this life if you need to yeah you know there's cars okay i don't know if there's any cars for a million but there's cars for a quarter of a million yeah. half mm -hmm. of a million mm -hmm. for sure so imagine you just bought two of that or you know i mean buying the property is okay because you know yeah, yeah you'd <laughs> hope that it will go um go up in value so you mentioned assets right and not buying liabilities can we talk a little bit about the importance of you know acquiring assets to to build wealth i think just again it's that education piece you know you can buy you could rather than spending on a company own the company do you know what i mean rather than buying those those trainers or you know that wig I don't know I don't know if you can own a wig company I don't know <laughs> but why not own the company yeah, yeah. yeah but why yeah. not own the company like all of these places where we're spending I like I give Amazon so much money I really do but just because of the convenience mm. give them so much money but I also own Amazon you know through an index fund so I think we really need to think about ourselves as owners rather than just consumers I think that's a good way to start. I think when we are doing things like purchasing property, 
you know, are you going to kind of live in it and, you know, just have all of the outgoing expenses or are you going to maybe rent a room and get some money come in? You know, are you, if you have the opportunity to, can you stay at home with your parents and, and just earn some income from it? I think... I think we just need to be really, cl- and if, even if you don't own an actual physical property, you can invest in, I sp- speak about in the book, you can sp- uh, invest in real estate investment trusts as well. So a little bit of money that you have, you can invest in, you know, businesses that own lots of commercial property, you know. So there's a way of investing. Yeah. There, there are ways of investing without having to have a lot of money. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of us kind of discount that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about this because I have never spoken about it on the podcast before, right? Mm-hmm. So you can you can actually start investing for your kids. I don't have kids yet, but yeah. this is definitely something I'm going to look at when I do have kids, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And you can do that through a junior ISA. Yes, yeah. Right? So I guess what are, what's the benefits of, you know, you know, opening a junior, if you do have a child, what's the benefits of opening a junior ISA for them yeah. and investing in it? Or so, doing a cash ISA actually as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. ISAs, you know, they are tax efficient ways of either mm. saving or investing. So yeah. for adults, we have either a cash ISA where you can, um, you know, you might get some interest on, on your savings and you don't pay the taxes. And then also you can open up a stocks and shares ISA, whereas you're investing the money uh, and any returns that you make, you don't pay tax on it up to like twenty thousand pounds so there is a cap it's not unlimited but it's better than they're not you know not being able to save tax free basically um and the junior isa is the same principle so Mm. it's an isa it's for people who are over under the age of like 18 and basically you can save up to nine thousand pounds each year into the isa and you can have a cash isa and you can have a stocks and shares isa and obviously you have children you know that at some stage you know they might want to you you might have school fees depending on where you want to send them so you could save up for that purpose because another thing that's good about ISIS is that you can take the money out as opposed to like a pension where it's locked in there until retirement but with regards to your ISA again it's just I mean, you're saving it for your child because they can't access the account until they're like 16 but even when they are 16 they can't withdraw the money. They can only withdraw the money at 18. But it's a really good way of building up money, either for things that are going to come along as they get older. So, you know, it might be school fees. It might be for a new car. It could be for university. It could be for for anything or first car for them, not a new car. It's a really good way of saving up for them. And I would go so far as say you should encourage your children you know any pocket money that they get to 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 save into it you know build that habit with them don't Mm. just save up the money and then when they're 18 and they get access to the account they can then withdraw it all (laughs) get them learning about you know the importance of saving or if you're investing the money for them get them learning about it so that when they get to 18 they're not likely to just blow it all you know access it and just blow it all yeah i would yeah. <laughs> personally if i was 18 yeah i got what 20k Woo. that's it exactly so um, <laughs> yeah so you can save up to nine thousand pounds in it and um yeah they access it at 18 or they can withdraw the money at 18 so yeah. be mindful of that <laughs> yeah it's um <laughs> it's uh it's, it's quite funny because it's like imagine being 18 and you get that much money yeah. oh my god yeah i mean <laughs> if, I, if i was 18 and i knew nothing like, like you know if i knew nothing when i was 18 so i i can't even imagine i would yeah. have gone on plenty of holidays definitely because i used Calm. to like my holidays yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that money would have been gone that 20 grand would have been gone <laughs> very quickly yeah so how does someone go about like obviously if they wanted to they're listening and watching this right and they want to set up this junior high so how how do they go about doing that yeah so i think you can do it with typically with your bank you know your your usual high street bank or a, a website that i love is called the boring money website and it kind of looks at the different like offers that are out there different financial institutions so yeah I, i'd say uh or, or a, like a martin lewis's website you know they probably you type in junior ice i'm sure you can get some information about it there as well yeah. so i think just you know your ordinary bank you should be able to open one for your child yeah Yeah, amazing so i wanted to end with this right so protecting importance of protecting what you have so Mm. so you feel quite strongly about life insurance and preserving what you've built talk to us a little bit about that yeah Yeah, so um as i've mentioned you know i lost my partner 
like maybe coming on to two and a half or just just over two years ago and, and and this is why it's really important like that relationship dynamic and talking about you know finances and and doing that joint planning like mm. you've said because when my partner passed away it was very complicated like his financial setup was very complicated you know he had a ex ex-wife he had a you know he had um, children or a, a child and I should you know I'll give you a little bit of background I won't take up too much time but uh, basically we were engaged to be married COVID happened we decided to push back the marriage so we had a date booked so and we'd been together for 10 years I lived in this house so we were cohabiting with the view with the plan of, of, of marrying yeah so he passed away six months before we were due to be married so on paper like if you see us together you'd be like okay you know these two are solid like there's no doubt about it but unfortunately legally like the law <laughs> um there's no like a lot of people would say to me after he passed but you're his common law w wife or you're his common law partner and that's that's not a thing in, in at least in England mm. maybe other countries it's 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 a thing but in England, no. So, and again, in terms of, you know, I he had his property, I had my property, I was living in um, his property. Um, and it just meant that when he passed away, and he, he passed away and he, you know, he didn't have life insurance, he didn't have like a pension, or he may have had a small pension. Um, his house was tied to his ex-wife so he's passed away and suddenly I had you know his daughter to, to deal with it's his child to deal with um and they had a very strained relationship so in the midst of grief you know she's probably thinking about her relationship with him and and then I so there was his ex-wife you know a daughter who's not very happy and I know you, you asked specifically about life insurance you know, life insurance is something that you can have. It, it can be helpful. You know, it can help you to pay off, um, you know, the mortgage. And I, um, I'm an ambassador for a charity called Widowed and Young. So it's for people who have lost partners before the age of like 50. Mm -hmm. And you do see like there's some people whose partners had, you know, life insurance. And it doesn't it doesn't take back, you know, the grief or the loss of, of having of losing that partner. But it just means the, the financial struggle of, OK, I now need to pay off this house. So I now need to take over this mortgage. The burden is off because they've managed to pay to pay off the mortgage through life insurance. Um, so I'm really I'm really I'm really passionate about particularly, you know, we have a, a, a tradition of maybe cohabiting like within certain communities, you know, and you can cohabit you can you can have children together and 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 things like that but you don't kind of get married or you don't mm. you know put someone down in your will or you don't do you know what i mean you don't have that planning in place that long-term yeah. planning in place i'm really really passionate and it's the reason why i'm talking about it. it's not it's not a nice topic to talk about no, no. but it's the nobody wants to right no yeah. no one wants to think yeah. about you know the worst going mm. wrong but i think it's really important to 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 really you know when you're with your partner really talk to each other be honest about you know what's going on with your financial affairs mm -hmm. and then p if you care about someone put something in place do you mm -hmm. know what i mean really put something in place whether it is just you know life insurance or you know having a will as well that like my partner died without a will which meant that um you know what he had what he would have wanted you know, for anything just mm. wasn't set out in place. You know, what yeah. would happen to his assets is, you know, who gets, you know, the small pension that he had or, you know, what happens to his funeral, you know, a lot of these things, there was nothing kind of set in place. So, you know, and, and legally his next of kin um, kind of took over certain things as well. Um so I just think it's really important for us, so particularly if you're you, you're a couple, you've been together for a long time, maybe you don't want to get married, but just create a will. You know, do you have life insurance? Life insurance can be used, and I'm sure you've had other guests speak about this. Life insurance can be used to, you know, you need to buy a new property because, you know, the person that maybe you want your child to go and live with, their house is too small for 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 you all now that you've got this additional person that you're, yeah. you've got care and responsibilities for. So I think um, we need to be aware of these these 
you know, planning tools or these, you know, yeah, these these future planning tools and use them, use mm. them because um, it's so vital. And I think my experience of of losing my partner has just taught everyone around me to do, to do to put things in place. So, for example, you know, my dad didn't previously pay into a workplace pension. He's coming up to retirement age now although he's going to continue to work when I speak to him about that but he's now like you know I've got a funeral plan in place you know I'll give you all of the details you know if anything happens to me you guys won't have to worry and it's yeah. about just you know if you see things happening with other people what what can we learn from that like mm. what, what can we gauge from that you know I don't want to see another like go fund me for someone's yeah, funeral that's, that's so sad it that, is yeah. it is really really sad mm. and um yeah, I think I, I'm talking about this because there was no planning. Um, and I know that for me moving forward, I just want to make sure, you know, if you know, I'm with someone going forward in the future, mm. there's there's plans, you know, yeah. like my son's taken care of, whoever I'm with is taken care of. You know, it's 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 very difficult dealing with grief and then also dealing with uncertainty about like yeah. finances, your mm. home and you know, um, yeah. So yeah. yeah, we need to we need to do better. Yeah. <laughs> and just yeah, get these yeah. things in place. Yeah. I think and you know, thank you for sharing the story and you know being vulnerable because it's um I know it's hard for you to um share that uh, and condolences to you thank as well. You. Mm -hmm. And um I think it stems from the fact that we don't talk about money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't even and we don't want to think about it people we don't want to yeah. think about it nobody wants to who wants no, to think about no. that nobody wishes that no. but it's like you said you said something that really struck me it's like um you know if you care about somebody you want to want them to be okay you yeah. want them to be patterned 100%. like like you yeah. said your dad said okay if this happens this is what yeah that's it that right? is, that if is anything it. happens yeah. to me then i want to make sure that this is how the picture is going to be i think that's important yeah, yeah. um and i think it's yeah i think it's very important for us to um to uh, to, to do to do that uh yeah selena has been it's been such a great conversation i had yeah we, we've talked about so much and we covered so many topics like i said it's an honor having you on thank the you podcast. for having me I'm, I'm, I'm so honored to be here you don't even know i've been waiting for my turn i've been waiting for my turn i'm like when is he gonna ask me to come on yeah no oh i was always going to ne never in doubt never in doubt uh so where can people find you if they obviously want to connect with you you know consumer content yeah. and yeah yeah absolutely probably. so everything is on our website and we're, we are on instagram as well and uh facebook because we're I'm a older millennial so <laughs> i need to get on tiktok um but yeah so it's www.blackgirlfinance.co.uk and on there you can book yourself in for a coaching session you can find out about our financial planning and advice you can read our blog we've got lovely um really useful kind of money calculators on there to make sure you to make it easier for you to budget and work out how much you're going to get from your pensions yeah. and investments so yeah so really useful tools on the website and yeah if you ever are struggling with your finances give us a call you know we offer a free 15 minute session we're really lovely to talk to and I say we because it's me and I've got um you know a small team of other financial coaches as well so yeah so do check us out yeah amazing like I said thank you so much for sharing your wisdom you know your stories as well I think when people share their stories people can relate to it and they also know that they're not the only ones kind of going through yeah, it absolutely. and we're all still learning and trying to you know 100%. get better with, with all of this stuff none of us are super experts we are human beings right we these are, conversations yeah. are hard to have you yeah. know sometimes so i really appreciate you know all your insights all your wisdom Thank all your tips you. um do you have any final words for the watchers and listeners i mean i would just say you know i think sometimes money is used as a replacement for kind of like our, our kind of self-worth and our self-esteem and i think if we can just realize how valuable we are realize how important it is to to value ourselves to the point when it comes to our finances that we are setting some money aside for ourselves um i think that's 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 when we can really uh, kind of make a change so you're, you're valuable you're worthy it doesn't matter how much money you have in your pocket you know just uh just know that you're valuable and you're worthy and just and just know that you can you know make these changes do these things you can build wealth there's nothing stopping us but that choice that we make yeah thank you You're great welcome. great great final <laughs> words love that thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the podcast and we'll see you next week's episode